Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends, dear friends of Memorial, well, first of all, thank you for this honor and this opportunity to give the first public lecture by Memorial. We very much hope it will be a regular event. But to be honest, my task today is not easy at all. It is very difficult to talk about our long work with historical memory against the backdrop of this war. And it's difficult to remain calm and restrained, which is essential for a sober historical analysis. In Russia, we often hear a quote from an almost underground Russian poet Nikolai Glaskov. He said that the 20th century was an extraordinary century. And then he added with irony that the more interesting a period is to the historian, the sadder it is to the contemporary. But today Today, we study our past and we play a very special role. We are the subject, the agent and the object of history. And I think that many of us, and at least it's true for myself, when we listen every morning about the news on Ukraine, we have the impression that the present, which seemed unimaginable a year ago, is gradually replacing the past. But we are today at an absurd historical point where the Russian authorities are trying to justify the aggression by their so-called great geopolitical past, and they are constantly indoctrinating their population, telling them that they have nothing but this imperial past. And to describe that past, some fantastic stories by so-called Putin's history are used. It's a collection of all sorts of false and poisonous historical myths, quotes from some murky philosophers, and uh, unfortunately, all those pseudo-historical myths in influence the Russian society and contribute to the acceptance and justification of the war. This lecture was planned long before the news came that Memorial, together with our wonderful friends from Belarus and Ukraine, had got the Nobel Prize, and it's the highest possible award for our work. But it makes us look back again and again on the paths we have traveled over those more than 30 years. And our goal is not to despair about what's happening around, but we are trying to understand what has led the majority of Russian society to reject peace, progress and human rights, the famous triad first formulated by Andrei Sakharov, the first chairman of Memorial, many decades ago. Quite recently, and still now, we can hear that Russia is returning back to Soviet times, but it's clear that those Soviet times are being reproduced only in some individual fragments, and it seems more like a parody to the Soviet era. In fact, there are much deeper processes at play, and when it comes to public life, when Memorial was created back in the 80s, the communist past had not been worked through, had not been overcome, but two things were crucial at that time. Soviet society in the first half of the 20th century experienced a humanitarian catastrophe. Millions of victims of mass terror uh, that affected all strata of population, a very hard war with enormous losses, Stalin's mobilization system, the Gulag camps, deportations of many nations. And the absurdity of the situation in the USSR was that millions of people knew about the repressions. They were witnesses, victims, accomplices, and often perpetrators. And the, the things they experienced was barely voiced either by themselves or by the society. The process of destalinization was quickly interrupted. And in the next decade, 
For the first time, we heard the voices about the Stalinist era, about the mass repressions, about the Gulag, but nevertheless, this topic very quickly became taboo again, and uh, it, uh, you could read about it only as in so-called Samizdat, self-published books, and it was not accessible to the general public. And I believe that uh, this memory was preserved thanks to our literature, because literature, even under uh, heavy censorship, replaced the history, because it was impossible for the historians to describe the events, the sources were not accessible, there was no solidarity movement like Polish solidar Solidarność. Uh, Dissidents were very few and far between, but a large stratum emerged, social stratum emerged, si uh, si uh, technical intelligentsia, literary intelligentsia, and many of those people aspired to an alternative culture, and they tried to uh, talk about people and people's fate. For them it was the main value, and today those who demonize perestroika and regard the events of the late 80s as a result of conspiracy against the USSR usually do not like to remember that this intelligentsia was the driving force of perestroika. So we can say that millions of readers supported Gorbachev reforms, readers of so-called uh, thick magazines, thick journals, well, you remember it, uh, those were where uh, magazines uh, published in millions of copies. So they wanted to reconciliate themselves with the communist past. And uh, there were very few young people in those uh, movements, those who were born in the 70s. Uh, everyone remembers it, because usually when you have some mass movement, young people uh, come out uh, on, in the streets, but in the Soviet Union, those people were older, uh, women. Uh, older than 40 years old, and though the generation of the 70s had many more difficulties to, uh, to find the right ideology for themselves, because they were uh, surrounded by censorship, by cynicism since their birth. And in 1989, Memorial was created. The main slogan back then was tell us the truth about political repressions and build monuments to the victims. In 1987, Gorbachev published an article which launched uh, those events, uh, which opened uh, those doors, because people wanted to know the truth. And uh, it's a very simple fact, but truth is very important. And this message was heard by millions of people. So Memorial in uh, 1989 became the first independent organization, the organization that demanded from the authorities the long hidden truth about the past, uh, the to open classified archives, to discuss and condemn state crimes, to re rehabilitate victims of terror, and to talk about them in the public, because we remember, and we remember it quite well. In 1989, there was no public discussion about the fate of all those victims of the communist state. So who created this organization? There were all kinds of people, not professional historians, but activists. Some of them experienced themselves the Gulag as uh, the first president of Memorial Academician Andrei Sakharov, uh, Arseniy Roginsky, philologist, uh, Sergei Kovalev, 
biologist. So people uh, of all ages and of all professions. And Sakharov formulated the main task for memorial. I remember his words. He wanted to reach every man, to talk about every fate, to find every name. It seemed like a utopia. But the main thing was to preserve this memory, to create an archive of personal and family histories. From the very beginning, memorial was a network. It was uh, a network of different organizations. And during the founding conferences, uh, there were repre representatives from all Soviet republics, more than 1,000 people. And those organizations, they were created in uh, quite a few cities simultaneously. So from the beginning, it was an international network because there were people of many different nationalities from different countries. And it is important that from the outset, in memorial, we had historians and human rights defenders. And uh, it's the characteristic of our movement, because we fight for of reconciliation with the past. We want to work through our past. So it's a common task, which is a continuation of uh, the struggle by dissidents in Russia, in Ukraine, in Baltic states, because in Baltic states there were demonstrations with slogans for your freedom and ours. Memorial NGOs emerged in different cities and people knew that, that they could come there and entrust us with their memories, that they could be heard, that their fates were important to us. And Arseniy Roginsky, one of the founders of Memorial, stressed that our task is not just activism, but daily research, daily work that we need to work like slaves, helots of history, to create databases, maps, collections, collections of different documents, lists. And for years, this work remained invisible. Only a small part of this iceberg was could be seen. We didn't have any tools. Those tools were being created by us. Uh, Aleida Asman, a famous historian, said about Memorial. Memorial, it was not just a project with some goals. It was a process of learning and development. And it was important that the history was not over. Someone took responsibility for remembering the victims. And it all developed so rapidly that by the beginning of the 90s, it seemed that the society and the most active uh, members of the society knew who was responsible for all those events. The Communist Party was responsible. And what did they have to do? They had to democratize the country in order to overcome this past and to learn the truth. And for this, it was very important to open the archives, the archives that store this historical truth. And as a result of those public efforts, in the beginning of the 90s, two very important laws were adopted, uh, important laws about uh, political repressions, and their goal was to open archives. And we believed that it was just the first step for a very long process, and that many more steps will follow. The, the first law was about rehabilitation of the victims of political repressions in 1991. And it was quite extraordinary, because those who were repressed uh, back in 1917 had to be rehabilitated. The preamble to this law read that during the years of Soviet power, millions of people became victims of the totalitarian state, were repressed 
because of their political and religious beliefs. And we have to condemn uh, this terror because it is uh, uh, incompatible with the rule of law. So the Russian, uh, the, the Federal Assembly of the Russian Federation expresses its deep sympathy with the victims of those repressions, with their families, and declares its unwavering commitment to achieving the guarantees of lawfulness and human rights. Well, it's quite extraordinary. I quoted it, but it's almost unbelievable. It seems almost unbelievable, unbelievable today. It was the only piece of law that was ado uh, adopted. So, and the next uh, uh, law was signed by Yeltsin in summer 1992. So we have historians today, they will understand me. Um, it was a law on declassifying acts and documents uh, that uh, were uh, the, the basis for mass repressions. Uh, so all documents about repressions, about human rights violations had to be declassified no matter how old they were. And thanks to those laws, uh, we had what was later called arch revolutions in the archives. So for the first time, the researchers got access to those classified papers. And it was just the beginning the beginning of very complex work to study Soviet system, to study its uh, most closed and secret part, the Gulag, the mass repressions. For the historians, for the researchers, it was the very important period. The documents were published, documents were in public access, and those documents that became declassified helped us to understand things we could not imagine before. We could understand how all this system worked. We saw that the system preserved a lot of things about its crimes. And it was uh, very important uh, to create a mechanism that could help to remember the victims and not to remember the dictatorship. And that's what we have been doing for all those years. A lot of research uh, projects were started back then. A lot of books were published. And it was quite difficult, believe me, together with foreign universities, uh, think tanks, museums. Our projects uh, had no borders. One of our great projects was about those people who were deported to Germany during the war. Well, it was not even a project, it was a program. In the beginning of the 90s, we got 400,000 letters from those people, and they sent us documents, and we studied their fates, we interviewed them. And those people told us about uh, their life in Germany, and uh, we uh, learned stories about uh, Frenchmen, Italians, etc. And that's, that, that project uh, was accomplished uh, in cooperation with researchers from Germany, from Poland. We founded a Polish program within Memorial. It's still active. Probably you know that uh, Memorial already now is a very important organization for Poland. Uh, almost every Polish officer killed in Katyn 
almost 20,000 of them. So almost every fate of every man, thanks to our Polish program, thanks to Alexander Guryanov, is known and is documented. And under uh, the political freedom and glasnost movement in the 90s, significant changes took place in the cultural memory and on the initiative of civil activists in many regions at the sites of mass graves of uh, Soviet terror, monuments were erected and in Moscow a stone was brought from Solotsky camp and it was uh, put in in Lubyanka Square, just in front of the KGB building, and this stone was supposed to be the first symbol, but unfortunately it remains the only symbol, the only alternative public movement, uh, monument, and it's very important for us uh, because we organize an annual action so-called returning of names. We read names of uh, those repressed uh, in front of this build, uh, this stone. So in the 90s, a lot of changes took place. Uh, some monuments, Soviet-era monuments were demolished. Uh, school and university curricula were changed. New textbooks were published. In school, teachers could choose textbooks, uh, which they used during, during their classes for the first time. So until the mid-90s, uh, this public debate about the need to overcome our past continued. It was a very active process. In uh, 1992, a process was started in the Constitutional Court against the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and the documents for this process were prepared by a group of independent experts from Memorial. And for the first time, those experts were allowed to consult the documents which were classified as unaccessible. And those documents made it absolutely clear that Bolsheviks had come to power because of a coup and that they were responsible for the bloody terror. But this process uh, didn't have a logical end. There was no legal assessment of the communist system and uh, we see the results uh, of this ambivalency uh, quite uh, right now. So already by the mid-90s we saw that uh, the process of rethinking our past is gradually becoming more and more inconsistent. For example, uh, in the documents, declassified documents, we could see that Lenin was a very cruel and bloody figure. And in 1991, Leningrad was renamed to St. Petersburg. The Guard of Honor in front of the mausoleum in Moscow is abolished. So for the young generation, Lenin is uh, some uh, figure from the past, from a distant past, which is not present in the public space anymore. You remember that uh, tourists uh, uh, could uh, buy matryo matryoshka dolls uh, with images of Lenin and Stalin on them, and we hope that uh, Lenin will be buried and mausoleum will be destructed, destroyed, but it didn't happen. So St. Petersburg was renamed, but the region is still called Leningrad region. We have a lot of streets and squares in Russian cities named after Lenin. We, had a, we have a lot of monuments to Lenin, more than 6,000 of them. And of course the main reason of uh, uh, for this was the fear of protests from the supporters of Communist Party. It was a threat for Yeltsin in the 90s. Uh, people were disenchanted and disillusioned and were nostalgic for their past.
In the 90s, people started to think about uh, the myth of a beautiful pre-revolutionary Russia and uh, some churches destroyed during the Soviet time were rebuilt. And uh, one could think that uh, this uh, would lead to further desovietization, that uh, monuments to Lenin will be destructed, but the opposite happened. By the end of the 90s, we saw that uh, People are become more and more nostalgic for their Soviet past. People were disenchanted uh, with the economic reforms. Uh, people lived through very harsh economic reforms. And uh, the reformers who came to power in the 90s were not interested in history and in the past. They didn't see a link between our past and uh, the success of democratic reforms. So the active historical and research work that started in the late 80s was gradually came to a halt, and the collapse of the USSR was seen as the biggest trauma. The authors of school textbooks offered no explanation, so children and young people didn't understand, didn't understand what was the reason for the revolution back in 1917, who was responsible for millions of victims, why the Soviet Union collapsed, etc. Uh, very much facts were given, but there, were, there was no coherent narrative of the past, and the lack of consensus within the society, society about their past led to a confusion. People had no visual reminders of the repression. There were no monuments, no memorial plaques. Uh, monuments were erected uh, on the outskirts in the city, at the sites of mass graves. And uh, less and less people read literature. Uh, for example, Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, it's quite difficult to read. And there were fewer and fewer people who were aware of political repressions. Uh, and by the end of the 90s, uh, well, the new monuments, the ident identification of mass graves, all this work was done by the network of memorial NGOs. There were over 80 such organizations across Russia, and regional authorities didn't help us too much, but uh, they didn't uh, stop those activities neither. So we didn't have any coherent story about our past. So this vacuum led to cynicism. The intelligentsia back then was unable to propose a new set of values for the society. And people became convinced that those are problems of the past, that we should not think about it. And humanitarian uh, knowledge, history and literature were not regarded as useful knowledge. And against this backdrop, once again, Stalin's image loomed in the historical consciousness of Russians. And at the beginning, it was not very visible. But in, the, in 1995, we saw Stalin's image during this celebration uh, of victory in the Chechen war. In the beginning of the two, uh, 2000, when Putin came to power, uh, we saw a fundamental change in memory policy. Uh, quite often, we started to hear that, well, there is no history, no objective history. We only have interpretation by historians. 
So we saw uh, some Russian version of so-called Noltianism. Uh, you remember Noltian, famous historian. Uh, well, people told that uh, uh, we have mass uh, crimes in other countries. Uh, Soviet Union is not unique. We can't. Uh, uh, deny them, but we are not worse than other countries. So it's uh, like uh, in Shakespeare's Macbeth. Uh, so let's uh, not think about our past. And the majority of the population chose stability in place of freedom. And the time of relative freedom for independent organizations was uh, passing and active members of the society saw it quite quickly. We saw that uh, there were more and more repressions, especially after the so-called Orange Revolution in Kiev. There was a fair, maybe something similar could start in Russia. Significant restrictions were imposed on NGOs. It became harder to register a new organization. The rules of reporting became stricter, and uh, NGOs were subject to fines and uh, regular checks. Memorial also uh, faced serious difficulties. It became uh, more difficult uh, for us to work. Ideologists from Kremlin who started to invent a new idea the idea of the state uh, focused themselves on the Soviet past and uh, took it as a source of national pride and the new patriotism. They started to rethink the memory about the Second World War and uh, this false memory replaced the real events about the and the real memory about the war and it became a, an excuse for new aggressive militaristic regime we saw the, um, uh, the aggressive uh, slogan of the Putin times, we can do it again. And we warned back then that uh, it was quite dangerous. And it should be noted that uh, some directions of this new Kremlin's policy were quite obvious because Putin took Putin's policy was not really well understood. It was quite eclectic. Well, uh, people knew that uh, well, repressions can't be justified, but still, Soviet Union was a great state, and its collapse was the most important catastrophe of the 20th century. Uh, our relations with the Baltic states, with Ukraine, were more and more difficult. Uh, uh, the state uh, could not uh, uh, accept the Soviet occupation of Eastern Europe after the war. Baltic states uh, were accused of justifying Nazism and uh, Soviet responsibility for Molotov Ribbentrop Pact was denied. And we had to constantly remind uh, about what had not been done in previous years, and a lot of things hadn't been done. There was no legal assessment of the communist regime, uh, we had no memorials to the victims, and uh, no state museums, no educational programs. Uh, 
But most importantly, we constantly warned about the consequences of this trauma of mass repression, the trauma to the society, because we had mass terror, but it was accompanied by a propaganda campaign against so-called enemies of the people. As a result, there was an atmosphere which stimulated some denunciation, hypocrisy, opportunism. People became suspect towards uh, everything unusual and uh, suspicious. As a result, we had uh, uh, very, uh, we have fear. People are afraid of the state, uh, are afraid of uh, the state who is aspiring to control everyone. People are afraid about expressing freely their thoughts. But the most active members of the society didn't want to accept this doctrine and to glorify Stalin. We at Memorial had more and more support. There were more and more volunteers, uh, more and more members to our, ac to our actions. There was more and more interest to our projects, to our databases. It became more and more intense, but this active part of the society was a minority, and state power was more and more repressive, and the new repressive phase started uh, with the adoption of the so-called foreign agents law, and no serious law scholar can explain uh, what this law is about, but it gave to the authorities the power to destroy any independent organization. So it was the reason why this law was adopted. Back then, Memorial denounced this law. And, well, in fact, this law was a copy-paste copy from uh, legal documents of the Stalin era. An agent, it's an enemy, it's a spy. So, and after the events of 2014 in Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea, a new phase began. So in the autumn of 2016, me International Memorial was included in the register of foreign agents because we called Russian, Russia's actions in Ukraine an aggression. But International Memorial, it's a network of, of organizations in Germany, in Czech Republic, in Italy. How can this network be denounced as a foreign agent? But there was no logic. This law was a, repress, a repressive one, and it became very difficult for us to be active in the public space because we were considered as a foreign agent. People were afraid to cooperate with us, different organizations refused to work with us. There was more and more uh, denunciation and libel in the media. And uh, Memorial organized a competition for high school students uh, we in, and uh, school children who came to Moscow uh, to take part in this uh, competition were persecuted uh, by activists, and we had uh, no help uh, from the state. Uh, on the contrary, federal TV channels uh, uh, insulted and uh, verbally abused those school children. They called them anti-patriots who rewrite history and are paid by foreigners. Teachers of their children, of, of those children, their parents uh, were uh, invited to conversations with FSB agents who were curious uh, how did they know about this competition. 
and who recommended to the school children to stop cooperating with memorial. It's just one of uh, a lot of examples to show you how difficult it became for us to work as a foreign agent. A lot of regional organizations came under pressure. For example, Dmitriev's case in Karelia, so-called Military Historical Society, tried to prove that in Sandarmuk we have not a grave of 6,000 executed victims of the Great Terror, but uh, Red Army soldiers. It is impossible to talk in detail about uh, all the pressure we experienced. And when we think today whether it was possible to foresee the events that started on the 24th of February this year, whether it was possible to foresee the war with Ukraine, well, I can say that we saw first signals of it a long time ago. We always try to remind to our friends and to our compatriots that it is very dangerous to use history for false historic propaganda. And this state pro propaganda has nothing to do with real history. And so-called pseudo-historical historical laws were adopted. Everything was forbidden, and uh, history is being rewritten in textbooks. We have lessons of patriotism at school. So this uh, propaganda uh, was used as a weapon against Ukraine. First, they talked about uh, events on Maidan as some Western conspiracy against Russia. Then they started to say that uh, power in Ukraine was uh, uh, tooled by fascists. They started to use the language of the Second World War. And uh, through the media, they tried to uh, convince the public that uh, Ukrainian state has collapsed and the Russian-speaking population there should be protected. So now it is quite clear that in every Putin's speech there is a direct link between his statements and the bombs that fall, that are falling on Kiev and Kharkiv. And why uh, does history play such a role in Putin's regime? It's a good question and I think researchers will think about it in future. Putin's Putin is trying to live in the past, and Girkin, this uh, crazy colonel who seized uh, Crimea and Donbass back in 2014, first uh, was active in historical reconstruction, but they uh, started to use real weapons and real blood was shed that so memorial is studying how history is used by totalitarian regimes. And it is an important question, why is this ideology so focused on our past? And uh, uh, I believe uh, it led us to the liquidation of Memorial uh, as an organization because our activity seemed very dangerous for the state. We are studying our past. We are studying repressions. 
for the sake of the future. And Putin is just focused on, he, or, or on the past. They have no image of the future. For them, future is just the repetition of the past. But I do hope that our work is common heritage, it will not vanish, and also we see that memory has no borders and no one, Putin included, can make use of this memory. So I believe our work will outlive them. Thank you.